If one were to ask, who was the greatest alim that India ever produced, Indian Islam ever produced, without a doubt, one of the greatest contenders for that, of course, it's difficult to say one person for sure, but without a doubt, one of the greatest contenders for that list would be Shah Waliullah ad Dehlavi. Shah Waliullah ad Dehlavi. In today's brief khatira, I wanted to highlight some of this man's accomplishments and why he is revered by such a large spectrum of people and some of his thoughts so that inshallah ta'ala we can benefit from the legacies of some of our great giants. Shahuliullah Dehlawi, he was born in 1703 in India and his father was actually the founder of one of the main madrasas in uh, the, the city of Delhi, the Madrasa Rahmaniya. And in fact, his father was also on the committee that Aurangzeb had assigned to write one of the most important books of Hanafi fiqh. It is called Fatawa Alam Giriya. Alam Gar is, is, of course, the nickname of Aurangzeb. So it's also called Fatawa Aurangzebi. It's also called Fatawa Hindiya. This is the most important book of that time frame. And Shahwariullah's father was on that committee. So Shahwariullah was raised in an environment of ilm. He studied with his father and eventually at the age of 15, he took over the teaching of the madrasa. Can you imagine at 15, he becomes the main principal and the teacher of the madrasa. Back then, you know, 15 wasn't treated like our 15. Back then, 15 was treated like 25. At the age of 15, he had mastered all of the sciences of his madrasa. He now takes over the position of his father. And a few years later, he decides to do something very few people were able to do at that time, and that is to go for Hajj. It was difficult back then to go for Hajj, and Shah Waliullah decides to go for Hajj. And so in 1730, Shah Waliullah made the journey to Mecca, and he stayed in Mecca and Medina for more than a year. This journey transformed Shah Waliullah completely. Had he not gone on this journey, he would have just been like any of the other locals. But you see, when you study from different sources and you learn from different pools of wisdom, different, you know, uh, 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 cisterns of knowledge, what happens is your mind becomes very different. And Shah Waliullah came back a very different person than he left. And he began writing treatises and books that are completely unique in the history of Islam. Really, when you read Shah Waliullah, you're reading a genuine mind. In Medina and in Mecca, he came across so many ulama from so many different regions. And his most famous teacher was somebody by the name of Abu Tahir al-Qurani. And this individual was actually one of the few people, the, it's, at the time frame, Ibn Taymiyyah was not a household name. And al-Qurani was one of the admirers of Ibn Taymiyyah. And so Shah Waliullah was introduced to Ibn Taymiyyah and the thought of Ibn Taymiyyah via his teacher al-Qurani. Also in Mecca and Medina, he studied the Kutub al-Sitta inside out. And especially the Mu'ta Imam Malik, he fell in love with the Mu'ta Imam Malik. And so when he came back, he came back with a love and a passion for hadith. And he single-handedly changed the entire discourse of Islam in India. And he came back admiring different people. Ironically, some of those people have different views, contradictory views. But Shah Waliullah admired all of them. His two most famous people he admired are actually contradictory in their aqidah and their thought. But this is what Shah Waliullah did, he synthesized. Those two people, Ibn Taymiyyah and then a very famous Sufi by the name of Ibn Arabi. Ibn Taymiyyah did not get along with Ibn Arabi. Ibn Taymiyyah critiqued Ibn Arabi did not like him at all. But Shah Waliullah loves the both of them. And he synthesized their thought in a very unique, unprecedented uh, manner. And when he returned, he wrote over 40 books and treatises. And the most famous of them, without a doubt, is Hujjatullahi al-Baligha. Hujjatullahi al-Baligha, the conclusive argument from Allah. Hujjatullahi al-Baligha. This book is unique in Islamic history. Why? Because he was one of the first people to write a fiqh book. It is primarily a fiqh book, but it is not full of dry evidences. It attempts to rationalize and explain the wisdom of why those rulings occur. It's a very different, the mind is a mind of an intellectual. He's not just bringing the standard evidences. He's trying to explain Allah's wisdom, Hujjat Allah, Al Baligha, the infinite wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so the book is a very unique spiritual fiqh book. And anybody who reads this can see for themselves when Shah Waliullah talks about the wisdom 
the hikmah of why Allah legislated what he legislated. And this is a book that is unique in its genre. Hardly anybody else has written it. Also of the unique books of Shah Uliullah is his first uh, translation and tafsir of the Quran ever done in the Farsi language in India. Nobody, by the way, at that time, Urdu was not the common language, right? At that time, the common language was Farsi. Urdu will come in the generation of his uh, son and grandson. Urdu was beginning, but it's still not you know, the, the common vernacular. It is Farsi. Farsi is the language of all of the Muslims of India. And at the time, can you believe there was no translation in Farsi? Why? Because there was this notion, which frankly is also found in Europe, that the average Ammi should not read the Quran. Just for Baraka, read it. You should not read the Quran for Hidayah. Leave this to the clergy class. We should have a separate category of people and only those people should understand the Quran. And the rest of you guys, you just read without understanding. And of course, Shah Waliullah did not agree with this at all. And Shah Waliullah, therefore, is a reformer. He's a mujaddid. He wants everybody to read and understand the Quran. And so for the first time in the Indian subcontinent history, Shah Waliullah makes a tafsir and a translation that is meant for all of the Muslims in the Farsi language. And he called it Fath uh, al-Rahman bi tafsir al-Quran, which is uh, the first commentary ever done in the Farsi language in India. And of course, by the way, again, that spirit remained in his family. All of his four sons became ulama and activists. And the first person to translate the Quran into Urdu was his son. His son, uh, Shah, Abdul Aziz, Shah Abdul Qadir, was the first person to translate into Urdu. Like his father was the first one in Farsi, so his son takes the spirit. And to this day, the first translation you will find in antiquated Urdu. This is like the Mir Dard Urdu. This is like the Mirza Ghalib Urdu, which even we have difficulty understanding. But the first translation was done by uh, Shah Abdul Qadir, which is his son, into Urdu. So, Shah Waliullah, what is the, what some of the main contributions that he did? Of the main contributions that he did, was that he attempted to quell sectarianism within mainstream Sunnism. When he came back, he came back wanting to unify as much as possible. And he demonstrated tolerance in fiqh and tolerance in tasawwuf and tolerance in sharia. He wanted the Muslims to be united as much as possible. And therefore he defends all of the madahib. And that was rare at the time. There was animosity between the madahib, especially between the Hanafis and the Shafi'is. There was actual animosity and there was actual intellectual, you know, hatred. Shah Waliullah, as a Hanafi, he was a Hanafi, he actually adopted Shafi'i positions in over 80 issues. And he championed the defense of the Shafi'i Madhab. And he praised Imam Malik. And he wrote a mini commentary of the Muwatta. And he made an excuse for all of the Imams that why they held what they held. He wrote a treatise. He wrote a book in which he defended all of the schools of Islam. The Hanafi, Shafi'i, Maliki, Hanbali. And he explained these differences are not meant to be contradictory. These differences because each one wanted to arrive at the truth in a different manner. Also, one of the main contributions of uh, Shah Waliullah in this regard is that he integrated between the Aqli and the Naqli sciences. And this is following Ibn Taymiyyah. Ibn Taymiyyah is also an, a paragon in this regard. The rational and the spiritual. The rational and the textual. Shah Waliullah wanted to show there is a healthy synthesis. And that's why much of his work is about trying to explain the wisdom of why the Sharia says what it says. One of the main contributions as well of Shah Waliullah was to sanitize the sawwuf. This is a bit controversial controversial here, but the Sawwuf before Shah Waliullah in India had been influenced a lot by Hinduism. Some of the ideas, some of the practices, in fact at many shrines, Muslims and Hindus worship together because it's almost the same for them. Shah Waliullah comes back from his sojourn in Mecca and he is an advocate of pure tasawwuf. He reformed tasawwuf from before and he brought forth, you cannot have tasawwuf without following sharia. Ah. Sharia ah must be a part of what tasawwuf is. And he also was against much of the practices, extreme veneration of the graves, extreme veneration of the saints. He was against this and he preached against this, that you should not be asking, you know, the people of the qabr, you should not be venerating the qabr. So his tasawwuf was akhlaqi, tarbawi, from the qalb. He didn't like much of the, you know, mysticism that was done uh, uh, that would be against, if you like, mainstream Islam. So Shah Waliullah also, at that time, there was a, a notion of Wahdat al-Wujud. It's a bit advanced here. Shah Waliullah did not accept this notion. And he attempted to modify it and bring it into mainstream Islam. Wahdat al-Wujud is the notion that there is no 
existence other than Allah. We are all a part of Allah. And Shawulillah did not agree with this at all. And he tried his best from within tasawwuf to reform and bring forth a, a more a nuanced understanding that attempted to tame down this uh, uh, misunderstanding that some people have. Also, one of the main contributions of Shawulillah is that he wanted to make Islam accessible to the average person. And this he did throughout all of his writings. He did not believe in having an elite class that the average Muslim should not be aware of the teachings of Islam. And so he wrote in a way and a style and even many of his books are in Farsi and many are in Arabic. Fluent Arabic, fluent Farsi in order so that the average person uh, understands. Also of the contributions of Shah Waliullah is that as a mujaddid and without a doubt he is a mujaddid. By mujaddid I mean he's original thinker. There's no question he is not following anybody before him. He comes forth and he is bringing a revivalism of the main issues of Shah Waliullah that India and all Indian movements owe much to is he single-handedly brought a love of hadith to India. Single-handedly. He brought a love of the books of hadith and he brought the silsila and isnads of hadith with him. It is factually correct to say that almost every single isnad and ijaza of hadith in that land, it goes through Shah Waliullah ad dihlavi Almost all of the scholars who study the books of hadith in that land, you go back and you will find it goes through Shah Waliullah. I also have a number of ijazat. All of my teachers that studied from anybody in India, whatnot, it all goes through Shah Waliullah. You won't find an isnad, or maybe very difficult to find an isnad that doesn't go through Shah Waliullah. And so Shah Waliullah introduced a love of hadith and the books of hadith into the ummah. Now, one point here, that one thing, we said he tried to unite the ummah, and he did in one aspect. Um, he was a very ardent defender of Sunnism against 12-er Shi'ism. And he wrote a number of books critiquing 12-er Shi'ism. And the reasons for this, it appears Allahu A'lam, is that Shah Waliullah is witnessing the decline of the Mughal Empire. It, the Mughal Empire began to decline after Aurangzeb. And Shah Waliullah is seeing the disintegration. And one of the main causes of disintegration is political. In the external side, you have a threat of a leader known as Nadir Shah. And Nadir Shah was a 12er Shia. And internally, the Mughal Empire begins to divide. And many Nawab dynasties began to rise up. And one of the most powerful was the Nawab of Awad. The Nawab of Awad. And the Nawab of Awad was also uh, Ithna Ashari, you know, 12er Shia. So it appears that he felt that this was a necessary thing to do. Allah knows best, but he does have a very harsh critique of the 12er Shia strand, and he does not like their uh, theology, which is, of course, he's not the only one uh, to, to do that. What is I find particularly very interesting, and this is so profound, every revivalistic movement after Shah Waliullah thinks they are the true inheritors of Shah Waliullah. And I'm going to be explicit because this is an education. I'm not taking sides here. In India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, there are a number of famous trends, right? Every one of them claims we are the real followers of Shah Waliullah. He had such an impact that it transcends any one firqa or maslak or madhab. So where to begin? One of the trends in that region is known as the Ahli Hadith trend. And they are people who follow the uh, hadith literally. They don't want to follow the madhabs directly. Shah Waliullah's grandson, Shah Ismail Shaheed. Shah Ismail Shaheed is one of the main founders. Actually, technically, one can say he is the founder of the Ahli Hadith movement. So Shah Waliullah's grandson, Shah Ismail Shaheed, who actually waged jihad against the British, and he died a Shaheed in a battle that he was fighting on behalf of the Muslims against you know, the British Empire. A long story is complicated here, but he died a young age, the grandson, fighting against, you know, in his jihad uh, against uh, the, the imperialists. And he is one of the main founders of the movement that eventually became what we now call the Ahli Hadith movement. This is the grandson of Shah Waliullah. Another grandson of Shah Waliullah, uh, Shah Muhammad Ishaq Dihlawi, was one of the main teachers of a person known as Ahmad Raza Khan Barelvi. And he is the founder of the Barelvi movement. And the Barelvi movement, of course, Ahmad Raza Khan is the founder, but one of his main teachers is the grandson of Shah Waliullah. And from that we take, because Shah Waliullah has such an interesting 
you know, uh, collection of books, you do find aspects of mysticism that can be interpreted the way that this group has interpreted it. So Ahmad Raza Khan studies with one of the grandsons of Shah Waliullah, and then he founds this movement that is now common in that region. A third strand of Indian Islam, which is the most predominant strand of that region, is of course Deobandism. And the founders of Deobandism, the founders of Deobandism, and that is of course uh, Muhammad Qasim Nanutubi and Rashid Ahmad, uh, Rashid Ahmad Gangohi, the both of them are admirers of Shah Waliullah. And they are people who have read Shah Waliullah and Shah Waliullah's love of hadith has impacted them directly. Any graduate of Darul Uloom, and our own Imam is a graduate of Darul Uloom, has to study the Kutub al Hadith. Why? Because Gangohi and Anatui, having been influenced by Shah Waliullah, have put the Kutub al Hadith in the curriculum of Darul Uloom. Nobody before them had done that. Before the Deoband, the famous institute was Farangi Mahal. Farangi Mahal did not have Kutub al Hadith. None of the other seminaries had the books of Hadith. After Shah Waliullah, almost every seminary is going to study the books of Hadith directly. Shah Waliullah has a direct impact on Deoband and Deobandism. And his books are admired and read by, uh, by uh, that as well. So we talked about the Ahl Hadith, we talked about the Deobandis, we talked to the Balilvis. Who's left? Who's left? There's one group that's left as well. That group is people like Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan and Allama Iqbal. How do you categorize them? We categorize them as miscellaneous, right? It's true, they are not a firqa. They have their own afkar. They are independent thinkers. But one can say that these are people who are emphasizing the aqliyat. They're emphasizing, you know, the, the rational side more. And the both of them admit that they are influenced directly by Shah Waliullah. How so? Because again, I'm being very simplistic. This is a very quick lecture here. Shah Waliullah is a fascinating figure and every group thinks they're interpreting him correctly. And this shows you he was actually a genius and a reformer and a mujaddid. You cannot put him in a box. You just can't. You know, I'm going to be blunt here. All of these groups are right and all of them are wrong. Nobody can claim I am the only heir of Shah Waliullah because he was a complex figure. You can't just put him in a box. And the groups that came after, they take what they want to take, and they don't take what they want to take. And that's fine, no problem. But Shah Waliullah was above any one simple box. And people like Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan and Allama Iqbal, they're able to reference Shah Waliullah for many of the things that even other ulama criticize these people for. But in fact, they have Shah Waliullah before because again, this is awkward to say, but I will say this because I want my community and the people watching, I want our knowledge of academics and Islam to be mature. I don't want us to be simplistic here. Shah Waliullah has many ideas. Some of them are amazing. Some of them are so-so and some of them are debatable. But see, this is what happens when you're an independent thinker. This is what happens. You can't have 90% tajdeed and reform without some 10% strange views. This is, and we have to be mature enough to understand this, right? We have to have the level of tolerance that you cannot have Shah Waliullah without having some views that are on the fringe. And I don't want to mention too many fringe views, but anybody who knows, I'll give you one simple example. And again, this is not a defense and it is not a criticism. I'm being very factual in this lecture so that you're aware. For example, Shah Waliullah believed that the splitting of the moon was not an actual split. It didn't actually split up. He had his theory that the Quraysh, it was made to appear to them so. It was an illusion that Allah did, that it was made to appear to them so. It wasn't an actual splitting of the moon. Now, if somebody says this now, A'udhu Billah, you are kafir, zindiq, dal, mudil, what not. This was Shah Waliullah's view. And Allama Iqbal took it. And Sir Ahmad Khan took it. And they accepted this point of view because they felt they have precedence. And he has his theories and understanding. Again, please don't misquote me because now the refugees are going to come on me. I'm just quoting. Shah Waliullah, guys, calm down, chill. This is one of the problems when you don't have knowledge, right? You become fanatical. Anybody who says something you don't, on your radar, you don't understand. But I say again, every Allama, every Mujaddid, every original thinker. This is what happens when you are brave enough to break away from taqlid. You're going to bring a lot of good. And you know, you might have some views on the fringe and we have to be mature enough to accept that. And this is also what happens when you study with diverse groups of people. Because Shah Waliullah didn't just study from his father's madrasa. He traveled the land. He studied from, and by the way, in Hajj, in Mecca and Medina, you have to understand, you had ulama from all over the world. It was a 
global university. And he stayed there for years or more than a year and a half. He stayed there. So all the scholars coming for Hajj, he studied with them from Iraq, from Yemen, all of this. So he's getting all of these different interesting ideas. And he was told towards the end of his life that why don't you write a refutation of Ibn Taymiyyah? And he ended up writing a defense of Ibn Taymiyyah. One of the first and only defenses in India of Ibn Taymiyyah is Shah Waliullah because he was a great admirer of Ibn Taymiyyah. Ironically, he didn't agree with everything from Ibn Taymiyyah, but this is why we admire somebody like this. He's not a blind follower. And he took what he thought was good from all of the great ulama. And his legacy is such that it sparked many revivalist movements. This is the sign of a true leader and thinker. That people read his works and they're inspired. So the founders of Deoband are inspired. The founders of Badilvism are inspired. The founders of Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan are inspired. The founders of, 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 of the Ahli Hadith are inspired because this is what happens when you're a genius and you spark people's minds. So all of them, they start thinking, they start doing. And this is what Shah Waliullah did single-handedly, without a doubt before him and after him, look at Islam in India, look at the intellectual history of India, single-handedly, he sparked an entire revolution. And I'll give you one final example, and inshallah with this we'll conclude. In the 18th and 19th centuries, made 200 years ago, the science of hadith was not studied in the Arab world. I know it's shocking, but it is factually correct. And I speak as somebody who knows, I studied in the College of Hadith in, in Medina, I know the history of the sciences of hadith. In the 19th century, if you wanted to study hadith, you would have to go to India. And that is why scholars from Hijaz, scholars from Arabia, some of the followers of Ibn Abdul Wahhab, when they wanted to study hadith, they were sent to India, to Delhi, to the schools of Shah Waliullah and his sons and grandsons. And so scholars from Hijaz and scholars from Yemen and scholars from other lands would travel to India in the 18, 1900s to study the books of hadith. And that's why the majority of isnads of hadith in the world actually today, not all of them, the majority of them, they actually go through India because of Shah Waliullah ad dihlavi So he's not just a mujaddid for Indian Muslims. He really created an entire uh, revolution of Islamic thought and he impacted the globe directly and indirectly. And he passed away relatively young in his 50s. In 1762, he passed away relatively young. And subhanAllah, every one of his sons and grandsons was an alim, an allama, every one of them. As I said, one of them goes Ahl Hadith, one of them goes Deobandi, one of them goes Barevi. Literally, like we can say, one of them sparks each one of these movements. And he left not just his own legacy, a legacy of family of scholarship. So I hope inshallah that in this brief introduction, one of the main points I want to uh, underscore is that the diversity of Islamic thought, the breadth of Islamic thought, and it is healthy, and I've said this so many times, it is healthy, O Muslims, to read from outside of your own school. And I ask you, for the love of Allah, don't just think your own maslak is the only maslak of Islam. No, go like Shah Waliullah did and find and listen and read and you will be pleasantly surprised. Oh my God, the other groups also love Allah. Wow, they also pray five times a day. Wow, they're not shayateen in, in human form. Wow, just open your mind, go study and you will benefit and you will become a more mature person and you will benefit the ummah more. And we find this in the thought of Shah Waliullah and also in a personal anecdote. When I was in Medina, some of my greatest teachers told me the same thing and I was shocked as a 22 year old. You want me to leave this land? And some of the greatest teachers, including my Indian Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Al-Azami, Sheikh uh, uh, Mustafa Al-Azami, I gave a whole lecture about him, the Hindu convert. Uh, even he said to me that my advice to you is you study here and then you study elsewhere as well. And he literally said to me, it will broaden your horizons and you will become a thinker. And at the time, and I was 22, 23, I'm like, what do you mean? I cannot, this is the land of Medina. He goes, no, if you want to really benefit, you have to go to different places and study from different people. And that really came into my heart. And subhanAllah, I have benefited immensely from that advice from him and from many other people. And we see it in the lives of all of the great thinkers of Islam. When you diversify and you listen and you take the wisdom of all, you end up benefiting a lot more people. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless Shah Waliullah Dihlavi and his efforts. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us all to be of those who bring benefit to the ummah. Wa jazakumullah khair. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.